Hello there! This video is all about correlation and regression to just give you a brief overview of the concepts behind correlation and regression so that you'll have a basic understanding of the numbers that you will be looking at in your Microsoft Excel extra credit assignment. So first things first, there's three different characteristics of relationships and the correlation is all about helping you understand the relationship between two variables. So form, direction, and strength are the three characteristics of relationships. The first thing I'm going to talk about is form. So form is just telling you what shape do the data points form when you plot X and Y in a scatter plot. So if you remember, you know, X represents the independent variable, Y represents the dependent variable, and you measure the independent and dependent variable for everybody in your sample, and then you plot dots on a scatter plot. Each dot represents one person's value of X and one person's value of Y. And we'll look at examples here in just a second. And just in case you forgot what an independent and dependent variable is, the independent variable is the predictor. It's what we think comes first. The dependent variable is the outcome, the outcome of the independent variable, or what we think comes second. But it's important to note that in correlational studies, we don't necessarily know which one is the independent and the dependent variable. In fact, we don't even know if there's a causal relationship between the two. We just make an educated guess as to what comes first and what comes second. So what's the independent variable or X and what's the dependent variable Y. And then we do a natural observation of the relationship between those two variables. So for example, you, there, we all know there's a strong relationship between performance and satisfaction. But it's unclear which one comes first. Maybe performance is the independent variable, and if you are better at your job, then you're more satisfied with your job, satisfaction being the dependent variable. Or maybe it's flipped. Maybe job satisfaction is the independent variable, and if you're more satisfied, you work harder and you have higher performance, and performance would be the dependent variable, or Y in that case. It's really unclear when you do a correlational study because nothing's being manipulated, nothing's being controlled, so you cannot make causal inference with correlation. So typically X represents what we think is the independent variable, Y represents the variable that we think is the dependent variable, and when you plot your data in a scatter plot, X goes along the X axis or the horizontal axis and values for Y are represented along the Y axis or the vertical axis. So if there's no relationship between X and Y, then there's really no pattern in your data. When you look at your scatter plot, dots are just going to be spread all over the place. Now if there is a relationship between X and Y, the two most common forms would be a curvilinear relationship and a linear relationship. And I'll show you examples of both of these here in a second. One thing that I want to point out though is that for our purposes, we are going to assume linear relationships in our data. We're just going to assume that the relationships are linear. We're not going to get into curvilinear relationships. So for our purposes, we are going to use the Spearman, or I'm sorry, the Pearson's correlation coefficient. And the symbol for that is R. So here's an example of a curvilinear relationship, which isn't something that we are going to be analyzing today, but I want you to see these different forms. So stressful work events and performance. So we know, you know, there's this sweet spot of stress right in the middle where if you have just the right amount of stress right in the middle, your performance is highest. If you don't have very much stress at all, then maybe there's nothing motivating you to perform. If you have really high levels of stress, you're overloaded and you're unable to perform because you're overwhelmed. So if you look at these scatter plot dots here, each dot represents one person. And we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 people. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 dots. Now I'm not going to have you actually create scatter plots for this assignment, but I do want you to visualize what your data probably looks like based on the correlation coefficients that you're going to be calculating with Excel. So this is a curvilinear relationship. This is also a curvilinear relationship, whereas this one was the inverse U, this is a U. And again, each dot represents one person in our data set, one person's age and car insurance premium. So here there's a sweet spot in the middle where you know you're between age 40 and 60, your car insurance premium is bottomed out, you know, barring any DUIs or anything crazy that would make your insurance premiums higher. 
and they figure that that's when you're the lowest risk to them. But when you're really young and you just get your license, you probably aren't that good of a driver and you probably still have this sense of, you know, invincibility because you're young and you don't have, you know, a sense of mortality yet. You feel like, you know, nothing can harm you. And then once you get to the other end of the spectrum and you're elderly, maybe your senses are starting to go, you're not as good of a driver, or maybe you just don't care anymore and you're like, who cares if I get into a car accident? I'm old and I'm near death anyways. I don't know. But your car insurance premium would be higher at the high end and the low end and lowest in the middle. So those are two forms that are not adequately addressed with the Pearson's correlation coefficient that we're going to be using today. We're going to assume a linear relationship where there's a consistent increase or decrease in Y for increases in X. And we'll get to the difference between a positive and a, and a negative relationship here in just a minute. So linear form, they're going in a constant direction. There's no change in direction when you plot out your scatter plot. Here is another linear relationship. So the first one, we were looking at time studying in hours and quiz grades. And it's consistent that the more you study, the better you do on the quiz. This would actually be called a positive relationship, which I'll get into more detail in a minute. But it's positive because the data, the X and Y are changing in the same direction. Those who have higher study hours tend to have higher quiz grades. See, as it increases, it increases. It's also a really strong relationship, which we'll get to here in a little bit, because the data is fitting a straight line, and it's a very consistent pattern here. You're seeing gradual increases in Y as X increases. Here's another linear relationship. It's negative because, in this case, as you exercise more, you tend to have less body fat. The two variables are changing in opposite directions. And when you plot that in a scatter plot, you see this downward slope here. Higher values of X, hours of cardio, are independent variable. Lower values of Y, dependent variable, body fat. And it's strong because data fits a straight line here, and you see a consistent decrease in body fat as hours of cardio per week increase. So I've already touched upon direction, but this is a more thorough explanation of direction of relationships, which is the second characteristic of relationships. Keep in mind, for our purposes, we're going to assume a linear relationship. So really, the heart of what the correlation coefficient will tell us is direction, and eventually we'll talk about strength. So this is all about the sign of the correlation coefficient. If your correlation coefficient is positive, then that means that, again, higher values in Y tend to be related to higher values of X for everybody in your data set. If you have a negative relationship, then that means that higher values of X tend to be associated with lower values of Y across everybody in your sample. And the correlation coefficient will either be positive or negative. Again, negative changing in opposite directions, positive changing in the same direction. So here's another example of, you know, the positive direction. Again, study more, higher quiz grades. They're changing in the same direction. And for the most part, that's what you see here. And it's pretty consistent. There's our negative direction again. Hours of cardio per week, as that increases, you have less body fat. Going the other direction, as hours of cardio decreases, percent body fat increases. Negative relationship going in an opposite direction. And when you look at the correlation coefficient, you'll see there's a negative sign in front of it. But for the positive one, there's no negative sign in front of the correlation coefficient. So that brings me to the final characteristic of relationships that can be told to you by the correlation coefficient, and that is strength. So the number tells you the strength. And keep in mind, you want to look at the direction and the strength separately. So you want to look at, is it positive or negative? Are they changing in opposite or the same direction? And then look at the number separately. How strong is this correlation? And you can only have a value for correlation between the absolute value of 0 and 1. An absolute value just means that you ignore negative numbers. So you can have a correlation, as you saw back here, that's negative 9.68, or 0.968, sorry. But you could never have a correlation that's negative, 0.9, 
2 or negative 9 or negative 1.5 or anything that exceeds a value of 1 in either direction, be it positive or negative. So you're essentially always going to have decimals for your correlation coefficients because 1 represents a perfect relationship, meaning that there's an exact perfect increase or decrease in y for each one point increase in x, which is really rare. And 0 represents absolutely no relationship at all, which is equally rare. Usually there's some sort of relationship between variables, even if it's just due to chance. So as the correlation coefficient, the number, gets closer to 1, that means there's a more consistent relationship. And if you looked at data, data plots in a scatter plot, they would almost, you know, come closer to fitting a straight line. As the number, the correlation coefficient, gets closer to zero, that means there's a less consistent relationship. So data plots would be more spread out in a scatter plot, and it's just, you know, less consistent. There's an unpredictable increases or decreases in y for each increase in x. And it's not important for you guys to really understand this too much, especially the effect size piece, but as far as the rough criteria for is a correlation weak, moderate, strong, or very strong, as it gets closer to 0.10, we call it weak. Closer to 0.30 becomes more moderate relationship. Any correlation around 0.50 is strong. And then really anything above 0.50, we consider very strong relationship. Again, the number's increasing. The strength is increasing, more consistent. So here's a relationship of a perfect correlation. The data points perfectly fit a straight line. This probably, you know, would not actually happen in real life, but for example's sake, I wanted to show you a perfect linear relationship. It's positive because dots are going upward. You also know it's positive because, look, as calories increase, weight is increasing. Not only that, but it's perfect linear relationship because it's so consistent. For each 500 calorie increase, there's a consistent 50 pound increase across everybody in your data set. So that correlation would be a 1, positive, because increase, increase, decrease, decrease, they're changing in the same direction, and 1 because it is a perfect linear relationship. Here's an example of a moderate strength relationship. So correlation around 0.283, if you calculated it out. Number of children and number of siblings. So this is data that I've actually collected in the past, and I was kind of surprised that there's not really a strong relationship between these two variables. But you can see, you know, if you drew a circle around the data points, it would be kind of a wide circle. Whereas here, if you drew a circle, it would be really narrow because it comes close to a straight line. It's very linear. It's perfect. And if you look here, you know, some people who had fewer siblings had fewer number of children. Some had a little bit more. And in fact, look, this person had four siblings and had two children. This person had one sibling and had two children. This person had two children and one sibling. This person had, or I'm sorry, two, two siblings and one child. This person had four siblings and one child. It's kind of all over the place. You don't see a consistent increase or decrease in Y as X increases. So it would be moderate, but it would also be positive. So if you do that drawing a circle around the data points thing, you'll see that there's kind of an upward slope here. It's hard to see when you just look at the raw data. If you plot it in a scatter plot, it's easier to see, and even better, which what we'll, we'll be doing in the Excel portion of this, getting the correlation coefficient tells you that it is positive and moderate. Here's an example of a weak relationship. It's really hard if you look at the scatter plot to determine the direction of the relationship, and the data points are all scattered out. Also, if you look at the relate, you know, X and Y for each person, the grade on anatomy and physiology and the percentage of passing stations on the OSCE. So I actually looked at some research and, you know, anatomy and physiology grades are weighed really heavily when it comes to getting into nursing programs and getting jobs in nursing. But research actually shows there's not much of a relationship between your anatomy and physiology grade and how well you do on this exam where they have you, you know, do multiple stations related to the nursing field and see how well you perform. This is a weak relationship. If you look at the correlation coefficient, it's pretty small. It is negative, but it's, it's so small there's not really any true relationship between these variables.
Now let's move on to the linear regression equation. And this is all about using the relationship between x and y to predict what do you think y would be in the population based on values for x. And the word population is important. So typically we're interested in a large group of employees or a large group of nurses or a large group of people in general or even you know a large group of items on an assembly line or whatever we are interested in everything that we're interested in that's our population we typically don't have access to that population so we take a sample of that population study the sample and then try to use that sample to make conclusions about what we think is going on in the population so the regression equation is all about looking at the relationship between independent and dependent variables in our data set and our sample and seeing what do we think would be going on in our population. How could we predict our dependent variable in our population based on the relationship between our independent variable and dependent variable in our sample. And there's something that's called statistical significance, which we will look at in the Excel portion of this. And essentially, if a finding is statistically significant, that means that we are confident that whatever we observed in our sample would also be observed in our population. Or in the context of a correlation, the relationship between X and Y is due to a true relationship in the population and not just due to chance or randomness. So the simplest version of the regression equation is when you have one predictor, one x value. We just have one independent variable. Now in the Excel assignment, we're going to have multiple independent variables, but starting with one independent variable is a good place to start for conceptual understanding of regression. So the regression equation is y hat equals bx plus a. Now y hat represents the predicted value of your dependent variable, predicted value of y. b represents the change in y for each one point increase in x. So b, if you have a positive relationship, you're going to have a positive b. So if your correlation is positive, your b is going to be positive. Conversely, if your correlation between x and y is negative, your b is going to be negative. Because think about it, B tells us the predicted change in Y for each one point increase in X. Well, if we have a positive relationship, we're expecting that Y will increase as X increases. So we would have a positive B. If we have a negative relationship, a negative correlation, we're expecting you know, that Y will decrease as X increases. So you would have a negative B. Now, X just stays x when you write out this equation because the whole point is being able to plug in values for the independent variable to see what you think the dependent variable value would be. So you just leave this as x. And then a is the constant. So that's essentially the starting point for your predicted values of y regardless of what x values you have. So here's a simple example of a linear regression equation when you have a perfect R equals 1 relationship. So college students pay a fee of $150 per semester, for example, and they pay $148.75 per credit hour. So in this example, 150 would be the constant. That would be the A in this example. So if we're going back to this, that fee would be the constant value. No matter how many credit hours you're taking, X, you're going to be paying that constant fee. B would be 148.75 because that is the expected increase in tuition, which in this case is our predicted Y tuition, for each one credit hour increase, we're going to see tuition increase by 148.75. So 148.75 would be the B in this equation. And you'll see that here, y hat equals 148.75, the cost per credit hour, times x, if we have three credit hours, plus 150, the fee, no matter how many credit hours you're taking. And you do that math, and you would be paying $596.25 per semester. Next example, if you were taking six credit hours, you still have, for the regression equation, 148.75, the cost per credit hour, times 6 credit hours, our x in this case, plus 150, the fee no matter what. To figure out that math, you'd be paying $1,042.50 for that semester.
The next one, same thing, you just plug in 12 for this X of 12 credit hours, and you end up with $1,935 per semester. These per credits are just if you divided this by the number of credit hours, tells you how, many, how much you'd be paying per credit. And I just kind of put that in there to show you that you actually pay less for your schooling overall when you take more credit hours per semester if there's a fee involved because that fee is being broken up into more credit hours. Okay, so in this case, our data points, our little dots here, will match a line exactly because we have a consistent increase in tuition as semesters increase. So remember the number of children and number of siblings example from before, where we had a moderate correlation here, that 0.283. Well, here, the regression equation, if you figured it out in Excel, would be 0.324x plus 1.955. So what this is saying is that for each additional sibling, we would expect you to have 0.324 more children. In this case, predicted Y, predicted number of children, X, number of siblings. So again, for each additional sibling you had growing up, you would expect 0.324 more children. And then this 1.955, that's the number of children that you would be expected to have even if you had no siblings whatsoever, according to this equation. And this line represents plotting this equation by just inserting various values of x and seeing what you get for y hat. So for example, if we inserted 1 into this equation, we would have 0.324 times 1, which is 0.324, plus 1.955, and we would predict if you had one sibling that you would have 2.279 children and that's represented right here. That's about 2.279. Let's move all the way to the other end of the spectrum here. What if you had five siblings? According to the relationship between number of siblings and number of children in our sample and the corresponding regression equation that we've created with this data, if you had five siblings, so 0.324 times 5 equals 1.62 plus 1.955, if you had five siblings, we would expect you to have 3.575 children, and that's roughly where it falls. So not only does this line not fit the data points perfectly because the relationship isn't perfectly linear, but we're getting decimals when we're actually looking at a discrete variable number of children. But that's okay. We're just trying to get rough predictions of what we would expect to see in the population based on this sample. And if this regression equation is statistically significant, then we could be pretty confident that we would have, you know, a decent prediction of what we would expect to see in the population. So how many children we would expect someone to see based on the number of siblings. But as your relationship gets weaker, your line fits the data less well, there's more error in your predictions, and your predictions are less likely to be statistically significant. Now let's look at this weak relationship that we saw earlier between anatomy and physiology grades, and then the percentage of passing stations on the OSCE. Remember that weak relationship. That's negative as well. Well, now when we look at this regression line that was generated from this equation, that was generated from the sample data, it doesn't fit the data very well at all. There's a big spread around that line. So the predictions will not be very accurate at all because the data is such, has such a weak relationship to begin with. But just like before, if we were trying to figure out what would we predict somebody's, how many passing stations they would have based on an anatomy and physiology grade of 60, so we would say, all right, negative 0.172 times 60 gives you negative 10.32 plus 82.0779, and you'd go up to about 71.76 right here. Just want to show you how the line you know, matches the data. And this equation, focus on the equation, we're going to be generating this equation, but a little more complicated form of it, as you'll see in a little bit, to figure out roughly how would we predict y based on x.
All right. Now there's something called the multiple regression equation. And this is really, really nice because a lot of times we're not just interested in how one independent variable predicts the dependent variable. So for instance, when you're thinking about car insurance premiums, age is not the only thing that you want to do use to predict how expensive your car insurance premium should be. You'd probably also want to consider the number of accidents they've had in the past, maybe even their credit score, things like that things that could tell you how risky of a driver they would be. Maybe even the make and model of their car, right? If they're driving a V8, they're probably going to be higher risk than if they're driving a four-cylinder vehicle. So multiple regression allows you to plug in multiple predictors, multiple independent variables to predict the dependent variable of interest. So instead of just having y hat equals bx plus a, you have y hat equals a b for each x times x, each x plus a. So let's say you had three predictors. So let's say you used age, make and model of car, and credit score. Or number, let's, let's do, let's keep it numerical. So age, credit score, number of accidents. So value for age, value for credit score, value for number of accidents. And then A would be the premium regardless of your age, credit score, or number of accidents. B1 would be the expected change in your insurance premium or your risk level for each increase in age after controlling for the number of car accidents in your credit score. Then if this X represented the credit score, then this B would represent the change in your insurance premium or your level of risk for each increase in credit score while controlling for age and number of accidents. And then this B would be the increase in your car insurance premium or your, your level of risk, how much they should charge you, based on the number of accidents as it increases while controlling for age and your credit score. So if you've ever heard of partial correlations, these kind of get at partial correlations or the relationship between X and Y after controlling for other things that are related to X and Y. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. If you're overwhelmed at this point, that's okay. This is the first time you've probably been exposed to this stuff. And this is really just to give you a conceptual foundation for what you're going to be looking at. I'm going to show you every single step that you need to do for the extra credit assignment to give you all the steps that you need to perform this well and get all the points that you need. But I just want to give you this background information so that you're not just a robot doing the things I'm telling you to do. You understand why I'm telling you to do them. So y hat still represents the predicted value of y, and you can still plug in any value pretty much that you want for x to figure out what you would expect y to be. Only now you just have multiple x's, multiple changes in y for each x. Okay, that's multiple regression equation. So now I think you have a nice solid foundation of what multiple regression single variable regression and correlation is so that while you're doing this assignment you'll know what what the terms are that I'm using and and how they tell you about relationships and predictions among variables